representatives of the three points of the world. Assembly in New York from 10th to 12th December 2003 for the first phase of the Rome Summit on Social Society. He declared their common desire and commitment to build a new commission society in this future century, inclusive and development oriented, where everyone can create, access, utilize, and share information and knowledge, enabling individuals communities and peoples to achieve their full potential and promoting their sustainable development and improving, improving their quality of life. And since the internet is the backbone and the heart of the information society, we can easily say that the leaders of the world in 2003 expressed their commitment for an internet that is um, uh, development-oriented. But now, <laughs> ten years after, can we say that the internet is serving the development? And if it is not, how can it become an engine for development and growth? To answer these questions, our panelists will address from various perspectives, issues like capacity building, multi stakeholder model, multilingualism, local content, cooperation, and internet ecosystem. Let's start with uh, Madame Sophie Matens, who, uh, who is the senior director of global service at the Internet Society, ISOC, and who will address principles to bring the next billion online so that they can benefit from it. So Thank you very much, Tim. And I'm to give you all this panel that addresses how the internet can be an engine of growth. And as Jenny said, we will all be addressing various aspects. I wanted to set the stage for the discussions by talking about the framework and some key principles to be addressed so as to allow the next building to access the internet and thus benefit from what is available. We all know and we all uh, have seen the, the, the developments and the impact that the internet has made on our lives, on our personal lives, on our professional lives, on the professional and economic and social environment around us. And I truly believe that the internet can have a profound impact on economic growth and social development here in Asia and around the world. And it's, uh, it's become indispensable, enabling unprecedented levels of interaction, engagement, participation, and influence. It can create jobs, economic and social opportunities, and Andrew and Lily will be, will be talking about the job angle of the particular question. There are many exciting initiatives underway to boost internet penetration and the use of internet around the world. We see Smart Thailand, we see national broadband network uh, plans, we see all kinds of exciting initiatives around the world. And initiatives to allow people to take advantage of the many benefits that the internet provides, the health, the, um, the education, also in rural areas, and looking at unserved and underserved areas and all that, and we will be talking about that. So we're looking at a number of initiatives around the world that promote the access and the benefits in of the internet. And as we've seen this week here in Bali, in my opinion too, the most successful initiatives are those that are defined looking at uh, using a number of principles. Those are defined with a multi-stakeholder approach, not top-down, but bottom-up, multi-stakeholder approach, and those which take a holistic approach and not just address parts of the puzzle. So the internet's power as a platform for economic and human development I think that it's only, it can only be truly addressed and unleashed when three fundamental pillars are present and balanced and addressed. The technical infrastructure, looking how to achieve an open, reliable, and sustainable internet. The governance infrastructure, generally a range of simple, meaningful parameters and measures designed to address and encourage public engagement, create a positive investment in the ecosystem which enhances the deployment, uh, of the 
internet and encourage an open internet and encourage the trust in an open, reliable internet. And then the human infrastructure, without humans knowing how to use the benefits, how to use the internet, the benefits of the internet, um, we can't have the internet as the engine for the development and growth uh, in, in the world. So we want people that are empowered and able, educated, uh, and empowered and enabled the rights of knowledge. In terms of the technical infrastructure, as the internet increasingly globalizes, the interconnection between networks, content providers, and users is more and more critical to create the network of networks that's the internet. And also the openness, the sustainability, the reliability, those are key technical issues that, uh, that, that are addressed and that, that, we, that we want to look at. But I want to look at mainly at the governance of the human infrastructure. When we look at internet as a, as a motor for development, as a motor for growth, we need to have the enabling environment. And we need to think of the ground. We need to think of supply. I was in the ground this morning and get barriers to connectivity. And people talked about how do we ensure that, that there is connectivity? But how do you have, what, what is part of that enabling environment? The investment ecosystem, connectivity. Uh, all of that. So it's important to think of demand and supply. It's important to think about affordability and accessibility. And it's important to create that realistic and attractive investment ecosystem so that people who invest in the infrastructure necessary, so that people who invest in the better in, in the applications in what is coming out of the internet. Since markets have been open to competition, I think many stakeholders have been using them and policymakers and regulators in particular have been using a variety of tools to achieve universal access and service, focusing in particular on supply. And regulatory reform is one of the first steps in which to achieve connectivity, including in unserved and underserved areas. And sometimes even affordability and accessibility to reach groups, um, including groups with special needs. So it includes developing policies, regulation, practices, a strong regulatory framework which accommodates convergence and competition so as to allow infrastructure to be rolled out, to, uh, to get over uh, barriers to connectivity. And we look at spectrum policy, we look at licensing policies, we look at competition law, we look at competition principles, we look at obviously at access and interconnection, we look, we look at other tools to create incentives for the private sector to extend universal access to uh, communications technologies to the internet. And these tools may be addressed as supply. But in addition to market liberalization, there can also be tools to encourage projects and operation in high cost or low income areas. And these can include tools that we've seen like universal access and service funds, universal access and service financing, other types of financing to encourage initiatives by national, state, local governments, cooperatives, NGOs, other types of private operators and other stakeholders are putting into place programs aimed at expanding coverage in rural areas and at increasing demand amongst all types of consumers. And again, this morning in the panel, I was listening to um, some, some of the examples, some of the wireless projects in some of the rural areas in which uh, regulatory tools are, require, uh, tools are required to be able to allow uh, the rollout of such, such infrastructure. But I don't think we can think, just build it and they will come. There's more and more uh, need to look at how to enhance the land and how to enhance the investment and how to create the opportunities so that the job opportunities can be created using the internet. So we have to have innovative demand side, or there can be, uh, look, we can look also at innovative demand side strategies to create institutional demand, to create um, applications, or to allow to, to, to encourage the creation of applications, and to encourage um, to look at uh, discounted tariffs, preferential tariffs, to increase the demand for ICTs and indeed for the infrastructure. When we look at the government's infrastructure, when we look at the internet as a motor of development, I think people have looked at uh, the, the risk or the, 
perceived dangers of what was happening on the internet, and that it needs to be introduced in the government uh, governance infrastructure, and the approach to governance infrastructure as well. So closing the internet is not the solution, but we will need to look at ensuring that the internet is stable, secure, and resilient, and that these issues are addressed, addressed by stakeholders so that we can continue to benefit from that open and resilient infrastructure to create those to benefit from those jobs and create those jobs. So let me come back to my thought, the holistic approach and the multi-stakeholderism. It's important to look at the big picture and resist the temptation to regulate too tightly. It's important to allow experts from the technical and commercial sectors to contribute and even manage the development process. So again, we can benefit from positive aspects of the internet. Looking at the human infrastructure, when I talk about an holistic approach, it's important to address the human infrastructure. It's important to look at capacity building. It's critical in the future development of the infrastructure because for the development for projects and development projects of the infrastructure to be of the internet to become self-sustainable, and indeed for investment in major infrastructure to become profitable. There, mu there must be local communities of technologists, innovators, early adopters who can build, maintain, and ultimately grow and sustain the networks to their full potential, and to, and to benefit from the, the, from the advantages, from the opportunities that the internet brings. We found everywhere that the internet has flourished, and it's done so thanks to the existing of a robust technical class of engineers, technicians, and users, who not only ensure the network keeps running, also create the tools for and so services that create local demand. And again, local demand, opportunities, economic and social opportunities. So to achieve the maximum benefits, it's important to have a holistic approach. And it's important to have to address the principles to have a multi-stakeholder approach, to listen to the forces on the ground, to make sure that, that there is capacity on the ground, and to have that investment for ecosystem foster new and better investments to achieve greater and wider infrastructure development and thus bring them the internet to the next Thank you to Jen. We're going to use the call. So let's go. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sophie, you said that uh, and um, uh, you spoke about uh, applications creation. I am not application creation and the local languages so that it would be useful for the people and customers. Because this is the most uh, the biggest problem of the different languages. They are using applications done by other people and other languages so people and the customers wouldn't benefit from them. Thank you again, Sophie. Uh, our next speaker our next speaker would be uh, uh, Andrew Ma, who is principal and founder of AM Global Consulting. He is also very active uh, at ICANN. He will share with us the experience in Africa and the global South in general regarding the internet as a driver of employment and economic growth. Please, Andrew, go ahead. Thank you very much. <coughs> And it's, it's a great pleasure to see all of you here. For those of you who may be from Bali, happy holiday. I think it's a, it's a warm day here, so congratulations. And uh, thank you all for being here despite the fact that it's a holiday. We appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to try to get this one to you. Great, okay. Uh, my, my, my presentation is entitled The Internet is a Driver of Employment and Economic Growth in the Global South, Challenges and Successes. And so one of the first questions I'm guessing is uh, why does the white guy from Washington, D.C. talking about the Global South? But uh, we work mostly in the Global South, especially in Africa and Latin America. We spend a great deal of time offering us on the ground, working with people who are trying to find good ways to use the power of the internet 
to, to create the kind of development outputs and, 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 and results that everyone talks about getting. But to some extent, we haven't seen as much yet as we might like. We all think of the internet as being tremendously powerful and having all of these future results, all of these, all of these, 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 these future capacities. So my talk is all about uh, what we're going to get in the near term, and specifically about the one thing that unites most of humanity. These guys. All right? These guys. No money, no rice. So uh, with that in mind, let me uh, go to the next slide. Okay, um, the talk is about economic growth and employment, so I thought I would start off by talking about them separately, and then uh, um, a little bit, and then uh, uh, pull it all together. On the economic growth side, one need only look at the cell phone revolution around the global south, especially in places like Africa, to see what incredible power new technology can have. Just a few years ago, about 12, 15 years ago, there were 10,000 cell phones in all of Uganda. Today, not one, but the two largest tax paying companies in the, the entire country, larger than the oil companies, larger than the largest banks, are the two largest cell phone companies. In Nigeria, a few years ago, there were a handful of cell phones, 20,000 perhaps, 30,000 perhaps. Now, for 170 million, there may be as many as 130 million cell phones. That's multiple cell phones for lots and lots of people. Just think of the amount of technology, the amount of power that's now in the hands of people. Think of the time savings. Think of the economic capacity that they talk about. You've got e-government. You've got e-services. You've got tremendous time savings, right? Now, we all assume that the value is out there. If you look at the World Bank state of statistics, they will tell you that the increase in the amount of cell phone, for example, will increase your GDP in a very measurable way. You can track it over the course of time. But when it comes to internet, tracking the value on economic growth is a little bit harder. Why? It's because of the way that the internet is, or has not to this point, been really integrated into the national economies and especially into the regional economies of places, for example, like East Africa. So that's the big picture, that's the macro, and, 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 and that's great. But when it comes down to it, these guys, in the hands of individual people, especially in the, in the hands of individual young people, individual rural people, individual people in the uh, Kailicha, Kavera, in the slums of Nairobi or, or, or Cape Town, these are the ones that guarantee social stability. They guarantee that the smart people stay in country, right? So let's talk about employment. Now, if you look at Uganda's, uh, Rwanda's plan 2020, right? Or Uganda's plan 2030. These are great development plans that the countries are putting together. It says, here's where we want to be in X number of years. And in almost every instance, you're going, to be, you're going to see that they have, as part of their development plan, an investment in and some significant expectation around this idea of, of, of a big growth in the tax sector. And in terms of employment, where are these jobs? I mean, if you look around, where are the jobs? Cyber cafes? A few people who can fix computers? A very, very small number of academics and programs, but a very small number. There's a focus on training, and we're focused on future jobs. But if you think about it, I mean, are the big winners so far really just the consultants? Are, do the hype and the reality really match up? What we've seen to this point is that a lot of the big winners are really still people at the top, people who had opportunities before the internet, and are now using their opportunities with the internet to create more. So, next slide. We have really high expectations for the internet, the growth of the internet, when it comes to ICT jobs. For governments, it's a way to grow your economy quickly, right? It scales like crazy. Grow in a decentralized way. Modernize. It's a way for a person in a secondary or a tertiary city, or think of it in the case of Indonesia. We've got a huge, diverse population spread across many time zones. 
tens of thousands, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of islands, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kilometers, right, from east to west. You don't need to go to Jakarta to make your fortune. You can stay on your island and use the internet to make money, but you have to be able to do that. So governments are very keen on this thing. They know that the infrastructure in the capital cities in most parts of the world can't take more people, right? Luanda, Angola has an infrastructure built for 600,000 people. Right now, half of the country, 14 million, live in and around the world. You don't have to be a math major to understand that that's a problem. So, for governments, for sure. For the private sector, looking to expand into new markets as the growth rates in the global north stagnate, and all the news that they get out of a country like Indonesia is these are growth rates. For donors in the developing world, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, they see this as a game changer. This allows their investments to go many, many, many times farther. And for, for you, who are looking for employment, you don't want to be an agriculturalist. This is a no-brainer, right? But are these expectations realistic? There are, this, this is also important because of respect to government, and an important way to avoid brain drain. Because many of you have spent time in the global south, you know that people will stay in government, for example, six months, a year, two years, then they're off to Canada, or they're off to the UK, and the ministry that beat them so badly loses its capacity. So let me move on to the next one. What I've done is I've taken a look at this. We sat down and we said, okay, what, what's really going on? What are the challenges going go forward? And for me, the future is in five P's, okay? The pipe, the infrastructure, okay? The, 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 the landing of sea, the sea cables is addressing in a lot of places in the world. Power. Power sources to run the infrastructure that you need. Again, with, if you look at the decentralized power, got power solutions, if you look at uh, um, uh, alternative energy, wind, solar, things like that, you're getting more investment in power and more solutions for power. Personnel, the famous capacity building, right? Capacity building in government, capacity building in, in but also just the individuals who are making the time and investing in their own selves so that they have the skills to take advantage of the internet. So those are all in black up there because I think that those are actually being addressed fairly well. But we have two that are really crucial that I don't think are, and we need, we need to work on them. Number one is payments. Number two is policy. So let's go to the next slide. So, payments. Much of the internet works off of credit cards. But if you look around the developing world, most people don't have credit cards, right? Just in Nairobi recently, and I was asking some friends of mine, how many of you have credit cards, and how many, how many have credit cards for the size of the population do you think there are? And amongst my room of very, very, very well-educated people, a lot of whom follow this kind of thing, their estimates were anywhere between 3 and 12% of the population. 3 to 12% is not a very large number if you're trying to get internet, get internet commerce going. So that's clearly the issue. Second thing, Many of these innovations for taking cell phone payments, for example, as in Kenya with Invesa, are terrific, but there's no cross-border standards in the global south, nor is there neither technological standards nor legal standards. One of the things that is great is if I want to buy something from another part of the United States, or frankly from Europe, we have technological standards that allow me to use my credit card, I know exactly what I'm getting, I can buy it, it shows up, it's very simple. Not so simple in parts of the global, the global south. And not so simple in terms of things like uh, in terms of things like intellectual property protection. There's a, the idea also is that the local solutions are hard to scale, in part because there are new and changing issues with security. One of the questions we ask is, can we work more closely with the financial services industry? It really comes down to one question. As I'm thinking about talking to my friends in Rwanda, we want to do work with. How can I pay you to do work for me, and how can I buy your stuff quickly and easily? If I can answer those two questions, we're good to go. I'm sending these to you, right? One piece is payments, the second piece is policy. And this is something that's very, very big, in part because a lot of countries are facing the question of policy for the first time, or if not for the first time, for the first time in the level of the level of sophistication that they have. Now, part of this is a challenge because some countries are policy generators, but most countries are policy takers, which is to say that they are trying to react to policies around the world. But one thing that we have seen almost without exception is that less is more. Why? 
As government is typically too late to do more than comment on last year's issue or last year's technology, given the speed of innovation. What government is bad at doing is anticipating what's next. So they need to get out of the zero-sum mentality and let the market flow. If they focus on IP protection, which is crucial to making money, because if I, I can't protect my IP, I can't get these from you, right? Um, countries where IP protection is strong, it's easier to get profitability. So my company requires less investment because it can get to profitability quicker. Obviously, we want to encourage investment in infrastructure. But it's important, we want to tax the back end, not the front end. A few years ago, when I was at the World Bank talking with the uh, Kenyan Minister of ICT, he talked about what I thought was a tremendously smart policy initiative, where he said, we're going, we're not going to tax the new pipe that's coming off the off, off, offshore cable. We're going to tax people who are making money off of that pipe. So what you end up doing is creating an open highway, and then you tax the cars that comes over that highway. Most people don't even think of those terms. It's tremendously important. And then the last thing is it's extremely important to make it easy for companies to start up and to run and to frankly tolerate failure. The rock bureaucracy and corruption, including in the United States, are killers. Because if you think about what makes it work in Silicon Valley and other parts around the world where this, 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 this and just the IHL in, in Nairobi, it's a similar kind of thing. They tolerate failure, you can, you can get people together quickly. But it's important that the way that the, 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 the system is set up does not, does not, does not, does not, does not be inhibit the okay. So, going forward, we need a collaboration with government, between government and the private sector. But government isn't going to be the higher religion. It's going to be the taxing number one. Number two, much more focus on getting paid. Make it easy for me to set up, make it easy for me to hire. Number three, this dynamic tension between risk and disruptive technologies needs to become more part of the global culture. We need to tolerate the constructive failure, the idea of constructive failure more. And governments will benefit, and people will benefit, and youth employment will benefit. And the last one is to tap everyone's interest, their own self interest, starting with the green jobs. Last slide. What is the internet? The internet is simply the world's greatest public-private partnership. Simply the world's greatest and most successful public-private partnership. That's what made it transformational in the global north, and what should make it so in the future in the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for this brilliant presentation. Now, what about Africa? Fatima Tassisila, who is the chair of the Africa who is organizing this workshop. After setting the African context, will tell us how education and capacity building can make internet serve the development in Africa.
uh, expansion and appropriation of mobile devices, not only in the cities but uh, everywhere in the countries, as uh, Nandima said. Uh, we have also production of local con uh, content produced by all the actors, education and training in ICT and internet governance are being implemented almost everywhere. A promotion of innovation with young entrepreneurs. Today we are just following the, uh, the awardees of the five program uh, funded by AFRENIC. And also we have the social media and voice of IP applications. Uh, the line must have real time in wireless communication. Uh, and this really promotes freedom of expression, uh, promotes transparency and good governance. We have today constant, timely, and accessible communication among African communities and between African communities and the diaspora. That's what we want to take our communities today. In terms of challenges, we have access gaps. We're around coverage is a problem. Uh, we have a problem of loss. It's very expensive to have access to board run. We have problems of speeds. I think we we'll explain some of the And also services. Mostly due to lack of knowledge or enforcement capacity among, uh, among the regulation for the regulation of the internet. Lack of competition among telecom operators. Limited use of available uh, We're planning to use this in a few countries. In Every in part of the country. We're going to do it in the projects. We're going to do it in the projects. Regulation is a huge problem for the protection of human rights, freedom of expression, online and offline, even though our countries have ratified all the conventions. It's not really being like a respect to the system we have in the past. We have a problem with violence, with freedom of expression, and personal data protection and human rights. Uh, we're not allowed to say everything. Uh, women are being harassed, and children being abused through the internet. So cyber security is a problem in Africa, and I guess in other countries too. Uh, we are kind of isolated from international e-commerce activities, as Andrew uh, said earlier. Uh, there is not operational digital signature and documents secure transaction interoperability of store are also problems. Now um, this is what we do. We have an inclusive infrastructure in partnership with privacy, privacy is a major actor. Build Implement strong capacity, strong capacity building and awareness campaign programs for all actors. Develop the regulatory framework to boost the upper private sector performance in the development for growth. What we see in Africa is that we have uh, uh, multinationals uh, running the, uh, the telco companies. And they're also being with the ISPs, with everything, nothing for the for local private sector. So they kind of blocked and nothing can happen. And this is very good for the development of the economies. Set up infrastructure for sharing regulations among countries, as well as within a community of countries, and we should be having some standards. Uh, we recommend to promote local community operator, operators and network to reduce the cost. Develop multi sectoral regulation to promote e commerce, e health, e education, e government, e services, etc. and communicate about the security and liability because they can exist and the community can use because they are trusted. Adopt open source and open data within the government's operating services. It's important for us because we don't have the resources today to pay for the for all the ways. And also this reduces the uh, um, 
Let's just say, I mean, he's doing that. He's offering maintenance service to this community thanks to this project. And students clubs organize in school governments to practice leadership activities and develop citizens' responsibilities and good governance of dances within the city and support the Sixty-three young women graduated from in Senegal. They are training in ICT and they are ICT trainers. I have I have uh, large, uh, structure in collaboration with the ICT Minister of uh, Senegal. We uh, uh, are training these 63 uh, ladies in and and this is something very important uh, to put in this uh, We had a high level planning during our national ideas and our community of the planet. And for the first time, the whole community uh, stood up and said, enough is enough, no more thoughts. Was something that concrete to come this time was to strike our fifth national uh, idea once we move on. And the minister said, Tell us what, what to do. And he was after discussing about you know, all the work we have, assistance, no ISP, no ISP, etc. And the mission was taken. He said that a multi stakeholder ICT presidential committee, this is at a very high level. To become an immediate revenue. And I think this will go with So now I would like to show you uh, quickly a video. Yeah. 